Well, good evening. Good to see you all tonight. We're looking forward to hearing from our special speaker, but I'll let Pastor introduce him. So hopefully you had a good afternoon, and uh, I love the cooler weather. You guys know I'm from Minnesota, so the cooler weather is what I... Uh, I was talking to our college kids today, and uh, we were talking about the book of Nehemiah and how when they built the wall, it was in the middle of the, middle of the summer. And uh, so I was talking about how I hate the heat here, and they were all like, yeah, you don't know if you've been anywhere south. I'm like, well, summer is pleasant where I'm from in Minnesota, so we like that. So, all right, a couple of announcements and a new announcement tonight. So I need everyone, everyone's going to need to pull out their phones. I know we're telling you to pull out your phones in church. Whew, scary stuff. Okay. We have Dr. Lyle with us tonight, and Pastor will give more uh, introduction for him later. But what you will do is you'll plot your camera on your phone. You will scan the QR code as you see on the screen, and you will, it will pull up a website. And on that website, they'll have an event number. You will type in 16019, okay, as you see on the screen as well. On that page, you will be able to ask questions to Dr. Lyle that he will answer at the end of his presentation. Okay, so if you have a question that you would like to ask him, um, here's the other cool thing about it as well. When you put in a question, if someone else lo- wants the, to know the same question, they can like your question and it will push it towards the top. Okay, so basically he's going to answer the questions that have multiple likes first. Okay, because that means more people are wanting to know that. So Pastor and Pastor Andrew will be looking through that as well. Um, so go ahead and we'll also shoot that up during his presentation on the middle screen. So he'll be able to get it during the presentation as well. But just want you to know that, that is a, you can ask the questions there for Dr. Lyle, and he will answer those, but you can also like other people's questions if you have the same questions. So we'll pull that up a little bit later, but I wanted to make sure everyone got... Knew it done. Okay, the people online, it should work for you on your TV as well. It should be on the bottom of your screen. You should be able to go up to it and do that as well. But I think we'll pull that up maybe later as well. I'm not sure. So it should be on the screen as well later as well. So, all right, next... Uh, we have Awana starting this Wednesday, and so looking forward to that. So if you can stop by in the, in the back with JD, I think they have all the uh, registration and stuff. If you've already registered, you can get your um, all the information, the packets and stuff that you need. So that starts this Wednesday night um, at 7 o'clock. And then also the back-to-school bash for the youth group is also this Wednesday night as well. That's for parents and teenagers. Uh, it's, it's kind of a get ready to get rolling for the new year. They'll introduce the new staff, the new uh, youth staff. And uh, looking forward to all the things that are going on. That's this Wednesday night from 6.45 to 8.15. So make sure you're aware of that. The Stronger Together Couples Conference uh, is going to be here on September 16th, 7 to 9 p.m. And then September 17th, 9 to 12 in the morning. It's $40 per couple. And so it's for engaged and married couples. You can sign up in the lobby or you can go online to sptindy.org slash couples conference. So just be aware of that. That's coming up in just a couple weeks. And our missionaries of the week are Watt and Phoebe. Uh, we don't give their last name or where they are. It's an undisclosed location. Uh, if you would like to know what's going on, their, their ministry is doing great. The Lord is blessing them. And so if you would like to know more about their ministry, you can look in the back where we have our missionary folder, and you can read about their ministry and their latest update that you have there. Miss Faith does a great job keeping that updated. So, all right, go ahead and stand. We're going to pray, and then we will uh, start our song service. Let's pray. Our precious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this wonderful day that you've given to us to be in your house. We thank you for your love for us, your blessings to us. Lord, first and foremost, your son coming to this earth to die for us. And we thank you for your love that we just cannot understand, that amazing love that you have shown to us. Lord, I pray that you'd help us as we um, see the sanctity of life and all the different aspects of that from Dr. Lyle tonight. I pray that you would just help our hearts to be um, encouraged, to be challenged, and help us to learn how we can best articulate our beliefs about the sanctity of life. Lord, I thank you so much for this time. Be with this service now in your name. Amen. Well, we're uh, glad that you're with us here tonight, looking forward to our service. Uh, Like Pastor Brett said, we'll shoot that QR code back up here in a second, and you're like, I can't figure this out, I don't know that, just flag one of us down, or you can write something down and we'll submit it for you. And then how to just like it, it looked kind of like little note cards, and you're like, ooh, I like that question, I have the one, you just tap on it, and that'll kind of be the like that kind of shoots it up, but we'll see how this works and kind of filter that, we'll do that at the end. But before we get to that, we're going to sing a great hymn, one of my favorite hymns, it is well with my soul. Wish I had time to talk about the writing of this. A pretty incredible uh, writing of this hymn. But we'll sing all four verses. It is well with my soul. <clears throat> when peace like a
bliss of this glorious thought, my sin not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross, right? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for that. Let's sing it on the third. My sin, oh, drop out, sing a part if you know it all together in the last. And tonight and it is well with my soul trust it is with your soul as well we had the opportunity given to us just last week of being able to have dr lyle come in tonight and talk to us about life in the womb and uh, it's just an exciting time for our nation an exciting time for our state as god is doing things that quite honestly most of us thought would never really happen uh, but we're excited that it is happening so i'm going to introduce him to you we're going to get right to this so that uh, we can have ample time for questions at the end. Dr. Lyle is uh, board certified uh, in obstetrics and gynecology and former OBGYN department chair. He is licensed to practice medicine in both Florida and Alabama, he served as an instructor with both the University of Florida and Florida State Medical School OBGYN uh, residency programs. He's been used by God all over the country as he's been sharing this great message. And so uh, when we had the opportunity, we said yes. So it's not been a lot of time for us to prepare for it, but uh, we're excited about being able to have him here. So Dr. Lau, you come right on up. Thank you very much, Pastor. Don't you love having a godly pastor who's bold enough to have a guy come and speak in his pulpit that he's never met before? I mean, talk about rolling the dice on that one, but uh, my wife and I are thrilled to be here tonight, and I love singing parts, and I love singing out loud until you realize it was on the second verse, I realized, I got a mic on, I hope it's not on, and I looked down to see, is the mute button hit, because I didn't want to put you all through that, you know, but Les and I love doing this, I mean, I love my job, I got the coolest job in the world. I get to be at the hospital at, during the only time that people are excited to go to the hospital. Then nobody ever says, oh, I got my gallbladder out on Thursday. I'm so excited. No, they don't do that. But having a baby, they, dads, drive, dads drive too fast to the hospital sometimes. But it's the only time where people are in the hospital and they're excited. And we're just helping a woman do a natural God-designed thing and bring new life into the world from inside of the womb. The practice that I took over in 1999 after I finished my residency training at the University of Florida was the largest abortion clinic on the Florida panhandle. When I called my mom, who's been pro-life and had guided me throughout my career, when my mo I called my mom and she goes, well, where are you going to practice? I said, I bought an abortion clinic. It's like, mom, 
mom. It's like, no, we bought the abortion clinic and we had him sign a restrictive covenant, a non-compete, where he couldn't practice any kind of medicine for two years. It pushed him into retirement and he actually moved back to Sweden. And for a long time, we didn't have an abortion clinic in Florida. And it was on a Sunday afternoon after church where I can't even remember what the message was, but I went to the practice. I finally had a key to my own office. And the plan was always just to buy it and then stop doing the abortions and stop doing all the referrals. And this was the first time I'd actually gone into the office by myself. I'd seen the downstairs. I'd seen the waiting room. I'd seen the exam rooms, my office, the billing area charts. I'd never gone upstairs. We are one and a half miles from Pensacola Christian College right there on Bayou Boulevard. And I'll never forget walking up the stairs to the surgical suite upstairs, and there was that old gray carpet. And I'll never forget how many moms have walked up these stairs with a baby on the inside, spent 20 minutes upstairs, and then went down those same stairs without that baby on the inside. And I turned the corner, I went around, I saw the abortion machine, the exam table, the stirrups, and all the equipment. I think, my goodness, we're on the same road as Pensacola Christian. There's a church with a thousand members over here, just a mile and a half away. How has this been going on in my town? So we decided we we're going to start a ministry. And that was really the calling. That's when we started the ministry of pro-life doc. And now we are all over the place doing as much as we can to not just make you more pro-life. I don't want you to walk in here and say, I'm a level, pro I'm a level seven pro-life. And I walked out of level nine. That's like saying, I walked in, I knew the gospel and I was excited. And I was a level seven. I walked out and I was a level nine of the gospel. No, we don't just want to get you lifted up on a, on a different level. We want to give you tools, tools that you can put in your toolbox so when the opportunity arises with family, with coworkers, with friends, with neighbors, that you have the tools to say, you know what, this is not just a religious issue. If you remember during the Dobbs case, um, Judge Sotomayor asked the pro-life attorney in this condescending fashion, she said, other than religion, is there any other reason to be against abortion? And what I wish he had said was patients' rights because these are my patients on the inside. We do a lot of teaching not just on pro-life issues. We spoke yesterday to the, uh, the teens on sexual purity because we're going to talk about abortion and we're not talking about sexual purity and sexually transmitted disease and God's design. Then we really aren't doing our full job. So we spoke, was it twice yesterday, twice this morning, and we're here tonight, and I'll be in my office in Pensacola tomorrow but we really do a lot of teaching with the medical students as well. I've been an instructor with the University of Florida, with Florida State, trying to let them know, yes, this is how we treat the preborn as patients, but then also let them know that there are people that are professional OBGYNs, board certified, licensed in multiple states, that say, and the babies on the inside of the womb have value, and they are my patients. So we were recently speaking at the University of Florida College of Medicine over in Gainesville. That's, I did my residency with the University of Florida. And we have the students there in the room, and I asked them, if I have a patient in my office that needs a blood transfusion, or this patient will die in a matter of days or weeks, but they were not born in the United States, do I have a moral and legal obligation to provide them access to a blood transfusion, even though they weren't born in the United States? And the students are all like, yeah, Doc, you, you do. It doesn't really matter. I said, okay, what if it's more expensive? What if they need something more expensive like laser vascular surgery? And if they don't get this laser vas vascular surgery, they will die. But they also were not born in the United States. Do I have a moral and legal obligation to get them access to laser vascular surgery? Now more heads are nodding, a little bit more obvious. I said, all right. What if it's even bigger? What if I have a patient in my office that needs open heart surgery, and if they don't get open heart surgery, they will be dead in two to three weeks, but they were not born in the United States. Do I have a moral and legal obligation to get them access to open heart surgery, even if they were bo not born in the United States? And, and a real bold student in the back stood up and goes, Dr. Lyle, here at the University of Florida College of Medicine, we've been taught that a patient is a person is entitled to respect and bodily integrity, and it doesn't matter if this patient was born in the United States or not, they need to have access to health care. I said, I agree. I went to the University of Florida. I was taught the same thing, along with prima non nocere. Latin, the first phrase we learned was, first of all, do no harm. I said, but there's one detail I left out. 
when I said the patient in my office was not born in the United States, the one detail I kind of left out was that they were not born in the United States yet. And that is the real key. And then the kids are like, what do you mean not born in the United States yet? And one says, you said like blood transfusions and surgery. I said, yeah. In my office in Pensacola, right there at our high-risk obstetrical clinic, we have done blood transfusions, two babies in the womb, as early as 18 weeks gestation, not even halfway through. These babies won't survive at a NICU until 23 or 24 weeks, and yet we can do blood transfusions to these babies in the womb. Well, it's not so much that we can, but why? That's the real key. Why would a baby need a blood transfusion in the womb? Because from the moment of conception, the baby is a different person from the mom, different person from the dad. The baby's a different person from the other seven, eight billion people on the planet. Not only half the time is the baby a different gender than the mom half the time. And how many genders? Yeah! <laughs> and God said, let there be man and woman, and male and female created he them. But not only are there different genders half the time, but a lot of times, mom and the baby have different blood types. And when mom and baby have different blood types, one of the first blood tests that we have when a mom comes in and she's celebrating her pregnancy and we're doing an ultrasound and everybody's all happy, you know, is that we do a blood test, see what the mom's blood type is, see if she has antibodies, and then we are going to then see if her antibody screen is positive. And if mom's antibody screen is positive, that means mom has some antibodies. And those antibodies can go from the mom, cross the placenta, go to the baby through the umbilical cord and start to attack the baby's blood. They attack that baby's blood. It's kind of like if somebody got a kidney transplant and it wasn't a really good match, the body is going to start to attack that kidney that was transplanted and it wasn't a good match. So when you have a baby who has a normal blood count and then antibodies from the mom are decreasing and attacking that blood and that blood count is dropping, if we don't do something, baby's going to get a real low blood count, baby's going to go into heart failure and that baby's going to die. So if one of you got in a bad car accident or a bad laceration, you show up in the emergency room and your blood count is really low, what's the ER going to do? They're going to give you a blood transfusion, bring it up to normal. We do the same thing on babies on the inside of the womb. We do this as early as 18 weeks gestation. Sometimes we have to give another transfusion a month later, three or four weeks later after that, because mom is still attacking the baby's blood. Where do you get that special baby blood? It's not. If you've gone to the blood bank or you've gone to the Red Cross and you've had a blood drive here at church or at work and you have O negative blood, we can use your blood and we can transfuse that to the baby and save that baby's life on the inside. How do you do that? Well, we take a syringe and then we use ultrasound. We guide the tip of the needle, this long needle, guide it through the skin of the mom's belly, go right through the wall of the uterus, and we guide that tip of the needle right through the fluid. Right, baby goes, what was that? It goes right on through, and it goes right to the umbilical cord, and we guide it into the umbilical vein, and we give that baby a life-saving blood transfusion. It's like, if you can give a baby a blood transfusion, is that baby a patient? Yeah. And a patient is a person who is entitled to respect and bodily integrity. That's what the guy at the University of Florida told me. And he's right. And they said, well, wait a second, blood transfusions. But you said like laser vascular surgery. I said, yeah, I sure did. And let me tell you how we do laser vascular surgery. Um, we respect the patient as a person, and a patient is a person no matter how small. When it comes to laser vascular surgery, it happens with twins. And we've had this at our hospital, and whenever we diagnose this condition, we send them, we send them to Dr. Luke Skywalker down in uh, Texas Children's Hospital in Houston. Why? Because when you have twin-twin transfusion syndrome, you have identical twins. Anybody here have twins? Twins, did they share everything perfectly all the time, all of their toys and all their food and all their candy? What kind of a mom were you? I mean, my goodness. No. In fact, they sometimes don't share well on the inside. And what happens is you have identical twins who happen to be sharing a placenta. But just like siblings or children or twins on the outside, sometimes they don't share well. So what do we do? Well, the problem is when we have this condition, we have twin-twin transfusion syndrome. So you have one baby who's taken the majority of the nutrition from this shared placenta, and this baby's getting really big. And meanwhile, this one is just like, may I have some more? You know, it's kind of like, you know, uh, Tiny Tim is over here saying, I want some more. And this baby is going to die if we don't teach them to share. And then when this baby dies, this baby will die. Remember this movie? There was a movie about this. That movie was, remember twins? Arnold Schwarzenegger, Danny DeVito? 
But this is how this actually happens. This is a fetoscope. This is a GoPro camera, essentially, that's inside the uterus. And we're looking at the placenta. See this blood vessel? We can map out the blood vessels on the placenta. And this blood vessel is taking an inordinate amount of nutrition over to the big baby. So what does Dr. Luke Skywalker do? He whips out his lightsaber. He whips out his lightsaber, and then he targets this blood vessel, and then he cauterizes it. And right there... You just saw that blood vessel cauterized. They will go right down that placenta, and they will say, this is your side of the placenta. This is your side of the placenta. Now, you two play nice, and we're going to send you back up to Dr. Lyle, and he's going to do a C-section in about eight weeks. And we deliver, and the babies that we sent down to Texas Children's Hospital, they went down like the 98th percentile and the 2nd percentile. By the time we deliver them, it was down to like the 80th and the 40th percentile. We taught them how to share on the inside. If we can teach them to share on the inside, is that a patient? Yeah. And a patient is a person, no matter how small. But then the students asked, they said, you said like open heart surgery. I'm going to show you something that's brand new that just happened over at the Cleveland Clinic you know, about a year ago. And what they did was they had diagnosed a baby with a tumor in the heart. And the heart is nothing but a big pump. It's about 18 days it starts pumping baby in the baby, in the, in the baby's uh, chest, and it's pumping blood from 18 days gestation until the day you die. But it's not, it doesn't take a break. It doesn't say, you know what, I'm going to take a minute off here. Just need a little bit of a kickback. It doesn't take a siesta at all. It's going to pump for the rest of your life. But just like if you have a bicycle pump and somebody throws a walnut in the bicycle pump, it's not going to pump real well. When you have a tumor in the heart, it affects the blood flow. And this baby was diagnosed with a teratoma, a teratoma in the heart that was almost half the size of the heart. And the baby was not going to live more than a couple of weeks. So what did they do? They counseled the parents and they said, you know what, your baby has a tumor that is affecting its life. We could deliver the baby and then try to deliver it, but the baby's only about 26 weeks at that time. We'd rather try to fix this baby on the inside. And then when we fix the baby, let the baby stay there in the womb. But I'm going to show you something absolutely amazing. It wasn't just that they did the heart surgery. They did the heart surgery, and when they brought the arms out, when the arms were out, they actually started an IV in the baby's wrist. Why did they start an IV on this baby? For hydration, for pain management, and resuscitation. If you are starting an IV on a baby at 27 weeks, doing open heart surgery, and then putting the baby back in, is that a patient? Yeah. And a patient is a person, no matter how but this is just a picture. This is an illustration of the mom's belly. And I'm going to show you some actual still pictures from the actual surgery, and you'll be like, oh, my goodness. But look at this illustration. That's the mom. That's the baby there on the inside. And I'm going to animate this, and we're going to look closely at the baby's chest. So here's the baby, and right there is the baby's heart. That is the teratoma right there on the outside of the baby's heart, and it's not pumping well. So what do they do? Mom got an epidural. They then made an incision in the skin of the mom, just like you were doing a C-section. They went down to the uterus, and they made an incision in the uterus. They reached in. They pulled out the right arm. They brought out that right arm, and then they brought out the left arm. And watch this. They put an IV right inside that baby. IV hydration, pain management, anesthesia. They then made an incision in the chest of the baby. And this is not real time. It took a little longer. But then they removed that tumor from the baby's heart. Then they closed the baby's chest they then removed the IV from the baby's hand. They then tucked in the left arm. They tucked in the right arm. They closed the incision in the uterus, and they closed the incision in the skin and said, hey, come back in 10 weeks. We'll do a C-section, and we'll deliver you and bring you to the outside. If you can do open heart surgery on a baby in the womb, is that a patient? Yeah. And if it's a patient, it is a person. And if it is a person, we have an obligation to defend them. But that's, this is the actual surgery on this baby. If you look up here, there's a camera right there in black. These are just handles, but that's a camera. So that's why we have these pictures. This is health care. When they say, see all the signs, they say abortion is health care. No, that is taking the life and stopping a beating heart. When you have a team of 12 doctors, nurses, anesthesiologists, and techs that are all together for one purpose, to save the life of the baby, that is high-quality health care. That's the baby's hand. Anybody here ever had an IV? Remember that tiny little you know, IV you know, there? Well, when you are only 27 weeks along, that looks like a huge fire hose there on the side because of how tiny that hand is. But look at the detail even there in that little thumbnail on that baby on the inside. The baby got anesthesia. They knew they were going to do an open heart surgery on this baby, and that doesn't tickle. Babies can feel pain, so they gave a baby pain management there on the inside. 
That is a patient, and that is a person, and that's who we are here to defend. This is when they were finishing up the surgery, actual picture. Baby's kind of giving a high five, like, dude, thank you very much. I'll see you in about 10 weeks. I've got my appointment. I'll be here. Don't worry about it. And then they closed up the rest of the incision. There's a technical term. Anybody know what the term is when we make an incision in the uterus like that? That is called a womb with a view. So there's a womb for the view right there with the baby. And the baby had said, hey, nice to hang with you. And they're going to do the sutures and close that up. And that is treating that baby, Rylan. Rylan turned one year, one month, and he is now one year, one month, one day, today. That is health care. Is that a patient? If he showed up at our emergency room, are you going to ask him if he was born in the United States? No. He's a patient. He's in need. We're going to treat this guy. How about this young man? If he shows up in our emergency room and he's in need, are we going to ask, were you born in the United States? No. We're going to assess his need and we are going to treat him because a patient is a person. How about this guy? This is a little kid. You remember this picture? It's about 12 years ago. This baby had a diagnosis of spina bifida. And Vanderbilt University is now really leading the charge on fixing spina bifida in the womb. And they are finding out not that they just can do it, but when they fix it on the inside, as opposed to wait until after the baby delivers, these babies, they are now following them for 10 years. When we fix them on the inside, 10 years later, these babies can go upstairs faster, downstairs faster, have better control of their bladders, better control of their bowels compared to wait until after the baby is born. Medicine can't fix everything. But we do have a duty to try to improve quality of life on everybody. And we are improving the quality of life. So you've seen those three patients. But guess what? This kid's name is Samuel Armas. This kid's name is Samuel Armas. This baby's name was Samuel Armas. This is the same guy. He was a patient there on the left. He's a patient there in the middle. And he is a patient there on the right. You tell me when he became a patient. He has rights here. He has rights here. He has rights there. He is an individual person from that moment of conception. His own genetics, his own chromosomes, his own blood type. And a patient is a person, no matter how small. But there's, we, want, we talked about how we're going to give you tools. I want you to go home remembering these surgeries. How you saw actual babies getting open heart surgery and a patient is a person. We talked about blood transfusion, laser vascular surgery, and we're just going to touch the surface. There is so much more going on. Children's Hospital of Philadelphia just celebrated their 2,000th surgery on a baby in the womb. They just had a reunion, a fetal family reunion. They had 650 babies that came back to Children's Hospital with their 3,000 family members to celebrate how Children's Hospital of Philadelphia had fixed and healed those babies on the inside. It's not just one or two places. This is becoming standard of care to treat the preborn as patients in the womb. This is another story I want to give you, and it's called a delayed interval delivery. Most people have never even heard of a delayed interval delivery. Well, let's just break down. It's delayed. It's an interval. It's a delivery. But it's with twins. We, you know, we had a mom who was visiting Pensacola a couple years ago, and she had been blessed with identical twin boys. These identical twin boys, one egg, one sperm, and that was the moment of conception. Before day 13, it split off into one twin here, one twin there. They are identical twins. So she actually visited Pensacola. There's a Toby Mac concert going on. And she's like, I love Toby Mac. I want to go down to Pensacola. So she's there and she's dancing while Toby Mac is singing. And then we got a baptism down there on the floor because she broke her bag of water and she was in preterm labor. EMS picks her up. They put her in the ambulance and so they don't want to deliver a baby. So they rush over to Sacred Heart Hospital. They rush her over to our hospital. She gets to our triage area. And before we can do anything, she delivers that baby, first baby right there in our triage. Immediately, that baby goes over to our $70 million children's hospital and is being attended to by doctors and nurses and all the best technology in the country. Meanwhile, while they're taking care of identical twin A, over here with mom, we're counseling mom and saying, we've got two NICUs. We've got the one with doctors and nurses, but we have the other NICU designed by God. And right now, the baby is doing well. And this baby, as long as this is doing well, we'd like to keep that baby on the inside. We'd like to give you some betamethasone or dexamethasone. We want to protect the baby's brain. We want to mature the baby's lungs and protect the baby's bowels. And it's like, how long can you do that? Can you get hours? Yeah. Can you get days? Yeah. There was a case in Tennessee where between baby A and baby B, 
with six weeks. This baby is born in June. This baby is born in August. They're going to be in different school years as identical twins. And it's like, so when you see one's in first grade and the other's in second grade, you look at the first grader and you go, you're not real smart, are you? <laughs> and it's like, no, I was born six weeks after, my, my, after twin A. It's like, I thought you guys were identical twins. We are. How were you born six weeks apart? Let me tell you a story. But the technology is cool, but now let's think about the moral issues here. This baby, baby A that delivered and went to the NICU 100 feet away, has all the rights and protection that I would have in a cardiac care unit. You have to provide. This is a person. Meanwhile, it's identical twin. That's 100 feet away in a different location in mom's belly. If mom were to choose and say, we didn't want two, we just wanted one. And if she lived in Virginia, my home state of Jersey, or up in New York or Cali, she could legally go to any abortion clinic and she could legally abort this baby. How does this identical twin have rights and protection, but 100 feet away, the baby that happens to still be in the womb doesn't have rights or protection? These are the tools we want to put in your toolbox that you can use in discussions and say, you tell me how this baby has rights and protection and this baby here does not because this is a patient as well. And a patient is a person no matter how small. When it comes to who created life, who has more than three kids here? Those dads are saying, yeah, I created life, you know. Guess what? You were involved, but you didn't create that life, you know. God created that life. Well, when do we have new life? New life doesn't happen on the moment that we are delivered. I don't decide that we're going to deliver somebody on Monday and say, I shall create man. And, you know, God has got I me. Mean, we have created man in the image of God, and we shall do it on Monday, or we shall do it on Tuesday. Nope. That happened at that moment of conception. Genesis 1.26. We read through the beginning of Genesis. Sometimes we read through, and God created the heavens and the earth. Next verse. Pause. What does that mean when God created the heavens and the earth? Look at our, our, just our earth. You fly all over the country and you say, wow, that's a lot to create. But then you know what? We're just a speck here on earth. And then you look at, well, how close is our sun? Well, it's far, far away. How many stars are in, just in our galaxy? I mean, there's a lot of things that the guardians of the galaxy have to cover. You know, there's 200 billion stars just in our galaxy. It's like, wow, that's a lot of stars, 200 billion? Yeah, let me tell you how many galaxies. There's 500 billion galaxies. So when we, we read, and God created the heavens and the earth, think about that. When you're looking up at the stars, you're just seeing our galaxy that's up there. Just as far as distance and time, if we were to take our fastest spaceship, I mean, Elon Musk says, I've got the spaceship plaid, and the spaceship plaid is going to go really fast. How long would it take to get to our closest star? I mean, there's 200 billion in our galaxy. It would take it 54,000 years just to get to our closest star. So when we read God created the heavens and the earth, that's a lot of creation. And then God said, oh, y'all think that is impressive? That's not really impressive because all of that creation, all the mammals, all the birds, all the fish, all the mountains, all the streams, on the river, all the oceans, that wasn't created in my image. Because in Genesis 1, 26, God says, let us make man in our image after our likeness. We're the crowning glory of, the, of his creation. It's like, that was nothing. Now we're going to make something in our image. When it comes to the American, y'all have a beautiful American flag. I hate, I hate doing this with the people on the camera. You ever seen somebody burn the American flag? Yeah. Does it get you angry? Does it just say you've been blessed to be in the, live in the greatest country that's ever been here on the planet? Why do they burn the American flag? Well, what does, the, what does that flag represent? That represents the image of the United States. If you hate the United States, you want to attack and destroy the image that represents the United States. What is abortion? Abortion is an attack against the image that God himself said, let us make man in our image. We represent the image of God in the womb as a preborn baby. So if somebody, this is a spiritual battle. If somebody hates God, they're going to want to attack the image of God, and that is the baby in the womb. And that's why this is not just a choice. This is not just, well, we're going to just use science. We are engaged in a spiritual battle. And if you're engaged in a spiritual battle, you have to use spiritual tools, and we need to use Scripture, and we need to use prayer because spiritual battles need both of those. When does science say life begins? We know that life begins, according to Scripture, at that moment of conception. We're going to give you the science. 
conception. We're going to do this appropriately for all kids. What happens at that moment of conception? I mean, moms, you know, you are so fine and refined and so delicate. You make a little cyst on your ovary, and then it just ovulates and it ruptures and it goes boop, and that one little leg just goes out. And then it gets gracefully grasped by the fallopian tube from the fimbria, and it brings it down into the, into the fallopian tube. Guys, we're all lined up here like it's a competition. We've got 200 million, maybe 300 million, and the race is on, and they're all swimming across. And they are swimming across, and they are going for that one goal. But they get inside the uterus, and there's a choice. Do I take the left tube, or do I take the right tube? Guys, do we ask directions? Doesn't matter how lost we are. You know, no. So what happens? Half of them are going to be wasted because they took the wrong tube. And the other ones are going to go. But then they are, they're swimming along and they're all racing. They get up to the egg and one goes, I won. I'm the gold medalist. It's like, uh-uh, this is a Spartan race. Now you've got to go through the, the, uh, the uh, you know, challenge course because it's not who gets to the egg first, it's who gets inside first. Well, they've all got these little hats on there and they all have enzymes and they're called acrosomes and they all start burying their heads through the egg to try to get on the inside. And finally one goes, I'm the gold medalist, I won this race. And the other one says, well, I want to get silver. There is no silver. There's a gold medalist on this race because if two get on the inside, that is not compatible with life. Well, how do you tell 200 million little swimmers who have swim, been swimming their hearts out that you need to go home because you're a loser and you don't get a medal at all? You don't even get a ribbon. You don't get an honorable mention. You need to just go home. Well, God designed this. He doesn't just say, everybody go home. There's a shield that goes up, and you can see this shield. And the shield is called the zone of pellucida. At that first time moment of conception, amazing chemical reactions happen. You've got zinc ions and potassium ions and calcium ions going in and out. And if you look with the right frequency of light, you can actually see a flash of light. These are mammalian fertilizations. And you can see that's the flash of light. So when people say, you know what? Philosophically, we really don't know when life begins. Yeah, we do. You see a flash of light. That is the moment of conception when one sperm out of 300 million has made it on the inside and that zone of pellucida goes up. That is the moment of conception. That is when life begins. We do a lot of blood tests. Moms, you're, you're like, why did they draw so much blood? Well, we need to know your blood count, your blood type, and lots of information, screen you for different infections, and look for antibodies. Nobody looks forward to the blood test. And then we see you on the second visit, and they go, hey, Mom, we got your blood results back. you got to start taking some iron. You're a little bit anemic. And you go, I wasn't anemic until you took eight tubes of blood out of me. You know, I was doing just fine on my own, and then you drained me, and of course I'm going to be anemic. But everybody doesn't want blood tests, but everybody wants an ultrasound. Ultrasound is an amazing view into the womb. In fact, I'm going to show you my daughter. She's 24 years old. That's my daughter right there. This is ins that's my wife's uterus, so y'all don't look at her and say, I've seen your insides, you know. But that's, my, that's our daughter, that's Sydney. She's 12 weeks along, that's her head, that's her bottom, that's her heart that's beating there on the inside. No Wi-Fi, no Bluetooth, no smartphones, no ear pods, but what do you do? You jump and you slide, old school. We're going to jump and we're going to slide. And you know, if we keep watching, she actually, I guess we had spicy Mexican food because she gets the hiccups next. And when you're hit only two inches long and you do a hiccup, your whole body just goes all over the place when you're floating around. But she was created in the image of God 10 weeks prior to that, and she's 12 weeks along from the first day of the last menstrual period. But you know what? That was 25 years ago. Has ultrasound got a little bit better since then? I mean, you remember when people would show you an ultrasound picture of their baby, and you're like, yeah, good for you. You, know? you couldn't even tell what it was. And ain't she pretty? It's like, I can't see a thing right there. It's like clouds in the sky. But now look, that's a portrait of a baby. This is the exact same baby about a month before that on the inside. That's a 3D ultrasound. And look at this. This baby on the inside lights its right hand up by its face. This baby on the outside lights its right hand up by its face. It's kind of like moms. I'll have moms who say, you know, get towards the end of their pregnancy. Well, how's your baby moving around? Oh, I can't wait to have this baby because this is a wild child. From 1 a.m. to 4 a.m., this baby is up like crazy. I can't wait to have the baby, and this stops. <laughs> first baby huh you know you think that if your baby is a wild child from one to four that all of a sudden you're going to deliver the baby you go mommy wants to get some sleep mommy really needs some sleep if you could just sleep until about 7 30 i'd really appreciate it baby's like uh -uh. i'm a wild child from 1 a.m to 4 a.m 
we identify baby's personality, and moms are the best barometer on when a baby is healthy there on the inside. If that is a healthy baby on the inside, that is a beautiful, perfect baby on the outside as well. But now we're doing other things besides just ultrasound. We're doing MRIs. Have you ever seen an MRI of a baby on the inside? MRI is a great technology. There's no radiation. It's like ultrasound. It's not like an x-ray. It's not like a CAT scan. It's an MRI image. I'm going to show you an image of this baby. story I hear is that the mom went in for an MRI of her, of her baby and of her belly, and they, there was a ball game going on, just getting ready to start, and they started playing the national anthem. So we see this image of this baby on the inside, and you start hearing, Oh, say, can you see? And the baby goes, I am not like that athlete over in Russia. I will not kneel. I will not sit. This is the national anthem that is playing. And as God is my witness, I shall stand. I shall stretch my legs. I shall push on the sacrum. I will stretch out my legs, and I will stand up on the inside. You can see the personality there on the inside. That baby is struggling, and you're going, come on, kid, come on, you can do it, stand up. I mean, I've had moms say this baby is just dancing like Michael Flatley on the inside. And I'm like, I know, I saw the MRI. They're dancing on your cervix. Yes, they are. These are the lives that we're trying to save on the inside. This is why we are pro-life. This is why your state of Indiana has made amazing advances to say the role of government is to protect everybody, and this is a person there on the inside. You'll see the, the uh, signs for this. You'll hear the chant for this. It's my body. It's my choice. Mm, you're wrong. Basically, you are wrong. From the moment of conception, that is a new body. That is a new person. It is half the time it's going to be a different gender, and 100% of the time it is a different individual, different from mom, different from dad, different than the other 8 billion people on the planet. Your body is a life support system for the baby. No different from after you have the baby. Yet you, ha you have the baby, and the baby says, you know what, I'm going to go on Amazon.com, I'm going to get myself some formula, get it shipped on into the house, and we're going to get everything. No, babies are just as dependent on the outside as they are on the inside. So it is not your body. Your body is supporting that baby on the inside. But it's not just ultrasound where we can see this new person. You, ha you ever been to a baby shower? Baby showers are fun for ladies. Guys, they're weird. Let me tell you. I mean, they do this game, you know, at baby showers where people are getting together because they want to get things that the mom is going to need. You're going to need diapers. And the girl looks and goes, well, I've got 10 packs. I mean, that should last me a year, right? It's like, first baby, you know, back to that. But then when it comes to the baby shower, I mean, guys, if you haven't been to one, they will take a diaper. They will put a mystery candy bar in there, microwave it, and then they'll pass it around, and you have to identify if this is a Snickers or a Milky Way or a, or a Twix. This, why would you want to assault a perfectly good candy bar by putting it like that? And I mean, I don't smell diapers. We had that diaper genie, and when I got him, and, and they said twist it twice, nah, and he's about 18. You know, yeah, you know, and then what do you do with a diaper genie when you got that huge sausage link thing when you're done? Do you put that in your trash? No, you play Santa Claus. And so at night when it's dark, you wander around the neighborhood looking for other people's trash cans. It's like, I think our ring camera just picked up somebody putting something in our trash. Oh, that's Dr. Lyle. He was just dumping off the diaper genie in our trash can. Go take it out and put it back in his trash can. But we treat the preborn as patients, and they have different DNA. So baby showers are cool. You ever been to a gender reveal party? Gender reveal parties are very different. It's not about that what the mom is going to need. What's this party? What's this celebration? Of all the, the parties in the United States now, that's the fastest growing form of party is gender reveals. It must be a Kardashian thing or something like that. And it used to be you had to wait until you had an ultrasound 18, 20 weeks, and you go... The magic of ultrasound says that you're gonna have a, you have a boy or you have a girl. Now we can do it with a blood test, not at 18, not at 22 weeks. We can do a blood test on the mom's blood as early as seven weeks after conception. And with more than 99% accuracy, I can tell you not if this is going to be a boy or a girl, but if this is a boy or a girl there on the inside. How do we do that? We've known all along that there's DNA fragments, little pieces of DNA of the baby that go from the baby through the placenta, go over to the mom's circulation, and they're in the mom's blood. But fragments of DNA, it's not just baby fragments, there's lots of mom fragments of DNA. And they all, to me, they look alike. It's like, if you had a sugar bowl, and I said, I got a sugar bowl, but I made a mistake, I put a pinch of salt in there. I was not supposed to put any salt in that sugar bowl. You got a minute or two. If you can do me a favor, could you get all the little salt granules out of that sugar bowl? Because I don't want salt in my sugar. Could you do it? No. 
guess what? They can do that with fragments of DNA. They can take the 95% of those fragments from the mom, and they can put them over here. Don't need them. Then they can separate out the little 5% of fragments from the baby's DNA, and they can go, huh, let's study these. This is a boy. This is a girl. And there are dozens of different conditions that they can screen for. So you can have a gender reveal party seven weeks after conception. You think, well, that's always good. Technology is good but people can use technology for evil. Do you know that you can get a gender reveal party, find out if it's a boy or a girl, and if it's not the gender that you wanted, you still have time to take the abortion pill at 10 weeks gestation just because it was a boy or just because it was a girl? That is sex selection. That is about as evil as we can possibly get. But we also can diagnose Down syndrome. We can diagnose Turner syndrome. Lots of things. But how can that possibly be bad? Look at the country of Iceland. Iceland was bragging about how they almost eliminated Down syndrome from the country of Iceland. Did they find how a way to keep every cell in the baby's body from having three chromosome 21s? No, they're just diagnosing babies with Down syndrome and they're offering abortion. They only have about one or two babies with, that are born with Down syndrome in the country of Iceland each year. Did they cure it? No. They are doing eugenics and they are killing these babies on the inside. Anybody know where the love gene is? I mean, there's a love gene, and you know what chromosome it's on? It's on chromosome number 21. How do I know that? Because a child with Down syndrome has more love than anybody else. If you know these children and you know these adults, they have more love. That is not health care where you're just picking out. Because what's next? It's Down syndrome this year. Is it going to be Turner syndrome next year? Is it going to be Edward syndrome, Patel syndrome? I mean, what are we going to say is, well, they might have been a baby, but they weren't perfect. They weren't what we wanted. And the country of Iceland is already leading that way, and people in the United States are using the same kind of technology to abort their babies there on the inside. But you know what? If you do that test two hours after a mom delivers a baby, or two hours after she has, she has an abortion, you can't find these little fragments of the baby's DNA. Because little baby Elvis here that was inside the mom, Elvis has left the building. And you can't find any trace of baby Elvis there on the inside overdose. I'm from Florida. We got a drug problem, but here in the city of Indianapolis, y'all don't have it y correct. Y'all don't have any narcotic problem in Indianapolis. Y'all do? No. Fentanyl came here too? Oh my goodness. You know, in 2020, for the first time, we had over 100,000 deaths due to overdoses. The majority were narcotics and the majority of the narcotic deaths were due to fentanyl. Does everybody who overdoses on a narcotic die? No. Why? We have an antidote and the antidote is called Narcan. Our cops carry Narcan, not just for patients and, and people in the field. They carry it for their canines because if the dogs are sniffing for fentanyl and they happen to find fentanyl, just sniffing that bag can put that dog in the cardiac, into respiratory arrest. And so they have fentanyl that they can give to their canine dogs on the, on, the, on the patrol. But we save lives with Narcan. Is fentanyl the only poison that's infecting the United States? No, there's a new poison, and that's called the abortion pill. And we're going to save the time because too many people don't understand what the abortion pill is. Words matter. Definitions matter. We need to define things exactly what they are. Let's look at the difference between the morning after pill and the abortion pill. They're very different. The morning after pill is indicated for the morning after, all right? It's indicated for up to 72 hours after somebody has had intercourse. They wouldn't even have a positive pregnancy test, and it'll force them to have a menstrual cycle. It's still wrong. The morning after pill is for up to 72 hours. The abortion pill, is it indicated for the morning after? Yeah. In fact, it is, should be called the 70 mornings after pill because the abortion pill is indicated for up to 10 weeks in the pregnancy. 70 morning after pill. My daughter, when you saw her jumping and sliding, that's only 12 weeks. It's indicated for up to 10 weeks. And there are already studies looking at 12 and 14 weeks. The abortion pill prior to COVID, 39% of all the abortions in the United States were with the abortion pill. Now, best data we have is 54%. More than half of all the abortions in the United States are with the abortion pill, up to 10 weeks. There are countries in the European Union where 85% of all the abortions are with the abortion pill. It's a poison. It is killing babies. How does it work? Dads, did you notice any differences in your wife when she became pregnant? Any difference at all? Personality or anything like that? Yeah, there's a lot of changes going on, guys. You know, and who's the conductor of the orchestra of the pregnancy? It's a hormone called progesterone. Progesterone. 
progestational steroid hormone. This is the coach that's like, hey, attention, y'all. We are now pregnant. We're going to divert more nutrition down to the uterus. We're going to allow the uterus to relax so that it can stretch and grow from the size of a lemon to the size of a watermelon. Cervix, you've got to stay closed. You've got to keep that baby on the inside. Oxygen, need more, more blood supply, bigger blood vessels. And it maintains the pregnancy. We're not going to have a menstrual cycle. How does the abortion pill work? The abortion pill works by blocking this vital hormone progesterone. So mom gets pregnant and coach progesterone starts giving all these orders. Then they take the abortion pill, they make a mistake, and all of a sudden the progesterone levels start to drop. When mom realizes she's made a mistake and she has regrets and she contacts our hotline, what do we do? We just give her progesterone. We give her progesterone to bring it up to normal. We are 70% of the time able to reverse the effect of the abortion pill up to 72 hours. I've attempted reversal 16 times. We've been successful 12 times. And I'm going to show you a picture in a little bit of that, of one of the babies. We just did another delivery. Was it three, three or four days ago that we had successfully reversed it? Healthy mom and healthy baby. So when we do the reversal, we just give them the hormone. And this is the toll-free number that you can call. We have a network of nurses that man our hotline, 877-558-0333. All you have to do is go to abortionpillreversal.com or abortionpillrescue.com. We've trained 500 doctors and nurses on the protocol of abortion pill reversal. To date, we have documented over 3,000 successful reversals, and we're coming up, we'll hit 4,000 this year. That's just a fraction of the number of abortions that are being performed. But there's nothing more rewarding to me than having a mom who made a bad decision. We served a God of second chances. You had a baby that was 98% chance going to die, yet we can intervene and we can save the life of the baby. So look at this. This is the baby. Mom has made a bad decision. She's taking the abortion pill. 98% chance that in just a couple of days, this baby is going to die, will never be born, and will just be passed. We invest, my wife and I pay for all the reversals we do. We invest $109 to buy back the life of that baby. Think about a, a scriptural term. What does it mean to buy back? Give me a redeemed. So what happened to all of us? All of us were walking on the path of eternal separation from God and eternal you know, death. And we're walking on that path, 100% of us, not 98%. Yet we were bought back with $109 worth of Prometrium. Now, nah, we were bought back with something much more precious, the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what redemption is. We sing redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. I've had patients come up, I mean, people in audiences come up and say, man, we sing about redeemed all the time. And I knew it was a good thing, but now I understand what it means to be redeemed. It means we were heading to death and we were bought back in this spiritual battle that we are all engaged in. It's not just a choice. A choice is if you got coffee or tea, a choice is Coke or Pepsi. When you're talking about the life of a baby on the inside, that is not a choice. We are engaged in the greatest spiritual battle of our lives. And if we're going to be engaged in a spiritual battle, we better have our spiritual tools, and that is going to be Scripture. So what, does the Bible address this issue of the babies on the inside? It sure does. In fact, look what God is saying to Jeremiah. God's saying in Jeremiah 1.5, Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you came forth out of the womb, I sanctified you, I set you apart, and I ordained that he be a prophet unto the nations. God knew Jeremiah. He had a role for him to play in kingdom service. Did God know you? Sure did. Did God have a plan for you? He sure did. That's Jeremiah 1.5. But look at Psalm 139. We talked about cell differentiation and growth. Yeah, we have that moment of conception, and there's just one cell. But are we all just one cell? No, we're not, we're not just one big blob of 180 pounds of cell. We are about 50, 60 trillion cells, each of us. Well, what happens? You have that first cell, and if you're going to start multiplying, you've got to go from one cell, two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64. At 10 weeks, the same gestational age for the abortion pill, at 10 weeks gestation, we've gone from one cell to one billion cells. But what's amazing is with all this cell division, they're all identical copies to start with. And then one cell says, man, I'm just like you, but I don't want to be like you. I want to do my own thing. From now on, I'm only going to read these pages of my DNA, and I'm going to start the entire skeletal system. If there's a bone, I'm going to make it. And then another cell says, we can do our own thing? I'd love to do that. I'm going to start the entire circulatory system. Heart, lungs, 
arteries, veins. I'm going to do just that. And another one says, well, y'all doing your own thing. I, I want to be the electrician on this party. I'm going to be the electrician, so anything electrical. I want to do the brain, and I want to do all the nerves. And another one says, well, I want to do all the muscles. I mean, I like muscles. Muscles are a good thing. How do these individual cells, when they are that tiny, know what their job? I can tell you, and science can tell you, from this point, this is what's going to happen tomorrow. This is what's going to happen the day after tomorrow. We have no idea. It's called cell differentiation. And I can tell you what's going to happen, but how do they know that? Because there was an amazing designer, there was an amazing architect, and that was God Almighty who put these... Things don't just evolve into that kind of complexity where they can happen. My goodness, it takes more faith to believe in evolution than in an almighty God. But when it comes to David, did David know about cell differentiation and fetal development? I mean, I have a textbook this thick at home just on the heart, yet all that anatomy just sort of happened and then it just sort of evolved that way. I got a textbook on just one organ. So what did David say? He said, you form my inmost being, you knit me in my mother's womb, I praise you, so wonderfully you made me. David said, there was a night of romance, and nine months later a baby came out. I can't explain it. What I can explain was that God knit me together in my mother's womb. But look at Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love for us while we were all sinners. Jesus died for us. I'm a sinner. I mean, besides my wife and me, any, anybody who's a sinner in the room? You got any? I got one. Honest man in the blue shirt, you know? Welcome, fellow sinner, you know? But you know what? So God loved us all enough that he sent his son. He lived a perfect life. He then wasn't killed. He gave his life on the cross for us. And he was buried for three days, and he conquered death, and he rose again. And we put our trust in him. We can spend eternity with him and have eternal life. But that's all sinners. Well, were we born a sinner? Yeah. Guess what, Roman, what Psalm 51.5 says? Surely I was sinful at birth, but look at this. Heck, I was sinful from the time my mother conceived me. We weren't just born with a sin nature. We were conceived with a sin nature. So if God sent his son to live the perfect life and then die for all of us out of love, and that includes all sinners, and we're sinners in the womb, and so God loved the preborn that much, should we do everything we can to defend the preborn if God loved them that much? Absolutely. And you just heard me use the term preborn. What's the difference between preborn and unborn? Words matter. Unborn. Unborn means at that moment in time that baby is unborn. Well, what's happening next? I don't know. Unborn. What's the difference between that and preborn? We are preborn. Preborn implies that, yes, at this point the baby is preborn, but that the baby is going to be born. Anybody have somebody, a child in school? We just went back to school, right, this week? Before you send your child to first grade and you send them to school, where do you send them? Preschool. Why? Because they're going to go to preschool and then they're going to go to school. Before you watch a big game, on, on, you, know, you, you watch you know, your local football team. Before you watch the game, you watch the pregame show. Why? Because you watch the pregame show and then you watch the game. We don't send our children to unschool. We don't watch the ungame show. We send them to preschool and we watch the pregame show. So we're going to use the term preborn instead of unborn. Pensacola Beach. Anybody been to Pensacola Beach? We just started having our turtles hatching because months ago we had the mama turtles come up there on the beach and they came in at night and then they dug a hole in the sand and then they laid their turtle eggs. And we have volunteers that go up and down with their four-wheelers, being very careful not to run over the sea turtles. And whenever they find a turtle nest, and we get dozens of them just on Pensacola Beach, they put up a fence. Then they put up a second fence. Then they put up a third fence, and they put these signs up. And what do they say? They say, do not disturb. Preborn sea turtles are there. There is Florida law. There is federal law, U.S. Endangered Species Act. Can you see that year? Somebody who's young over here, because all the young people hang over here. What year is that? 1973. So Congress passes the U.S. Endangered Species Act saying we're going to protect the preborn sea turtles. Meanwhile, what's happening over at the U.S. Supreme Court in 1973? They're passing Roe versus Wade. How can you have federal and state protection for preborn sea turtles, but babies in the womb, we don't have that same level of protection? That's what Dobbs was all about. That's why 
now is the time for what is the church going to do with this decision? We have had 49 years where Roe versus Wade was the law of the land. With a lot of work, we have reversed that decision. Is the church just going to sit idly by? No. This is why you have a godly pastor who is bold enough to have an event like this tonight to give you guys the new tools to go out and put them in your toolbox and make a change. Because, you know, they protect the pre-born sea turtles over on Pensacola Beach, but if a mom with a baby on the inside comes over the three-mile bridge from Pensacola Beach and goes to our one abortion clinic that was in town up to 24 weeks she legally could have aborted that baby until just recently how do we have protection for turtles on the beach but three miles across we don't have that same level of protection for the babies in the womb so why are y'all here i know why we are here we are pa i don't know if my passion has come across but this is what i am passionate about my wife and i we travel all we were in georgia we're going to be on both sides of the country going all over the place because we are passionate about this why are we here together tonight to really make a difference remember when mordecai was with esther Esther's there and she's in that position and all of a sudden there's a plan to kill the children of Israel and Mordecai is talking to Esther and Mordecai, this is my, this is my best Jewish rabbi impersonation, but Mordecai says to Esther, he goes, ah, Esther, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this and the number one role of the church is to share the message of the gospel, the good news, salvation is available. Number two has got to be defending the preborn in the womb. We have an opportunity now to really change the direction of our, of our country. If we do not take this opportunity, I can't even think. The United States will stop being that shining light on the hill. It will stop being the country that is sending out missionaries. We've been given an opportunity, and we need to maximize the way that we share this opportunity. Because is God going to continue to bless a nation that has already killed 63 mil, million babies in the womb created in his image. That's the entire population, every man, woman, and child in Cali, and every man, woman, and child in Florida since 1973 we have allowed to die. This is our opportunity to get involved, and your state has made advance, amazing advances. So can we win? People always say, hey, can we really win this? My goodness, there's our Milky Way, Guardians of the Galaxy, zipping all over the place in the movie. That's us right there. The God who created not just that galaxy, but 500 billion other galaxies, not only hears our prayers, but he answers our prayers. And we're kind of sitting back and going, I'm not sure if we can win this thing. My goodness, he's on our side. That is the God of the universe, not just of our galaxy. So can we win? Absolutely. So what's the answer? Are we going to stand up for the preborn? Sure. Are we going to be a voice for the voiceless? Sure. Are we going to be defenders of the, the, the defenseless? Absolutely. We're going to get involved with our pregnancy centers. We're going to stand up for my patients because a patient is a person no matter how small. But what's the real answer to this? The real answer is real simple. It comes down to one word. It's going to be the gospel. It's the gospel that changes hearts. It's the gospel that changes minds. It's the gospel that changes behavior. You really want to change the behavior in the direction of the United States, it's going to be through the power of the gospel. We all need to be engaged in this issue. Someday, guess what? Unless Jesus comes, we're all going to die. We're all going to die, and we're going to immediately go up to heaven, and we're going to see our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we're going to look around and go, I am here for all eternity. And we're going to get on our knees. We're going to go, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And what are we going to think about? We're going to think about, how did I serve his kingdom when I was here on earth? I was here for maybe 70, 80, 90 years. What did I do for kingdom service here on earth? And we're going to think back and say, when I heard the Holy Spirit lead me, did I get involved in that pregnancy center? Did I put up a billboard? Did I stand up with somebody and educate them and teach them the things that you learned tonight? And our goal that we all, the words that we all want to hear when we're face to face with Jesus and we're on our knees and going, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for all you did for me. We're going to look back and see how we served his kingdom and hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. God bless you all and thank you very much. Questions and answers. Did y'all figure out that QR code and how to put questions in? And we already got them flowing? All right, come on up. Let's do wow, it. Wow, what a blessing that is. You can come right on back up. So if you want to uh, take your kids out, that's fine with you. We're going to try to filter through the questions to make sure that uh, we're asking questions that will be appropriate. Uh, but um, anyway, wow, uh, we've got a job cut out for us and a God that has been so good to us. So Pastor Andrew's going to ask questions. Pardon? Um, take a break or just go? How many say, I need a break, Pastor? Let's give me five minutes. Go ahead. 
Anybody else? We're going to get started then, so sorry. Good. Good. All right. Um, the, most, the most popular question, I think, was submitted by the teenagers, so uh, we're going to skip it. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, <laughs> So parents, I'll talk uh, to y'all later. Parents, all right, we'll can, get that uh, question answered. You answer. can answer that question to them. You can have a conversation with them, and if you go on the QR code, you can see what that one is. So, um, I'll try to group some of these. Uh, we'll try to keep it thing. But if you think of someone that's young in here and I want to hear some of these responses, that's totally fine up to you. If you want to take them out, uh, the second most popular question was: If life begins when sperms fertilizes eggs, how do we biblically? and morally handle eptopic pregnancies and other life-ending decisions? Sure. When it comes to lives, we have two lives there. We have the life of the mom and we have the life of the baby. The number one pregnancy-related cause of death in pregnant women is still a ruptured ectopic pregnancy in the first trimester. Ectopic pregnancies occur about 1% of the time. We see them. If we had the technology and the skills where we could move a pregnancy from the tube and move it into the uterus, we sure would. We do not have that technology. If we have two lives and we can only save one life, Judeo-Christian principles all stand at least save that one life. If we had the technology to save them both, we would, but we don't. So we will save that one life. Now, we always want to make sure we do our due diligence, make sure it's an ectopic pregnancy, and look for something called a heterotopic pregnancy. A heterotopic pregnancy occurs about 1 in 15,000, where you have twins, but one pregnancy landed in the tube, and the second pregnancy landed on the inside of the uterus. I've only delivered 4,000 babies, but I've had two of these in my career. So when we see one pregnancy in the tube that's just directly affecting the life of the mom, and we see a second pregnancy in the womb, what do we do? We do surgery. We go and we remove the ectopic pregnancy. When we remove that ectopic pregnancy that we can't do anything about, then we will then be saving the life of the mom and the life of the baby. There are conditions where we need to deliver a baby early, like with moms who get preeclampsia. I mean, there are reasons where, you know what? Your health is in jeopardy. You're going into liver failure. You're going into renal failure. You have elevated blood pressures. We're concerned you're going to seize. The cure is not killing the baby. The cure is delivering the baby. And we have the technology where we can save these babies' lives. There was a baby up at, up at University of Alabama, Birmingham, was born at 22 weeks and three days with good dating, and that baby went home from the hospital is doing well. So deliver a baby early, yeah, but it's the delivery that cures the mom, not the killing of the baby. Okay, kind of a follow-up to that. Sure. I'll kind of group a couple of them together. <clears throat> In your opinion, at what point is it right or necessary for an abo abortion? Some have asked in cases of, Bad things have happened to a lady. Like what? Or relationships. So in your all opinion. Right. Well, what, what say it's rape right or incest. Life? I mean, that's, you know, there's all that news. The mom's real young. We've had 12 and 13-year-olds that we have followed. Is it a little bit more challenging following a 12-year-old? Yeah, just like it's more challenging. The oldest patient I ever delivered was 49. Guess what? A lot of the risk factors with really young and not really old, but older women is that you do have an increased risk of preeclampsia. Can we diagnose that and treat that? Yeah, we sure can. Just because of the circumstances, whether it was rape or it was incest, that's what's in the news, and that's what everybody is talking about. First of all, when we have that report, we need to investigate it absolutely thoroughly and completely. And then we need to prosecute, we need to have a trial, and if found guilty, punished to the ultimate you know, extent of the law. But when you think about a situation when it comes to a baby and the situations of its conception, are we going to behave the same way after the baby is born? as we would on the baby that is on the inside. If we find out a month after a baby is delivered, it's like, oh my goodness, we just found out this baby was conceived because of a rape. Do we then kill, take the life of that baby that is now a month old on the outside? No. So why should we treat it any differently when the baby is on the inside? We do not give the death penalty for a baby because of the sins of the father. You know, we have traveled conferences all around the world and around the country. And we have met a lot of these moms and babies and their children who they were conceived by, whether it was rape or some sort of other horrible sexual attack. And we talk to these kids and they say, my dad was a bad person. My dad was a rapist. But that doesn't mean that I deserve the death penalty. What should the church and what should society do? We should take these young girls in, meet all of their medical needs, meet their spiritual needs, their psychological needs, and their health needs. And that's the role of the church, and that's the role of good government. The role is not to kill that baby because of the circumstances of the conception. 
Good. Uh, another question moved to the top. Is it true we don't really know how the sperm and egg fuse? Oh, no. We know how there's actually penetration. And there are people who have done their PhD just on the sperm entering into the membrane. I mean, the membrane isn't this homogeneous piece of, you know, um, of, uh, of paper or of plastic. It is amazingly complex with all sorts of different, you know, cellular structures. I mean, there are potassium pumps, there are chloride pumps, there are, you know, calcium pumps, and that's what happens. And there is actually a rigid shield that goes up. So we understand the enzymes of the acrosome, but we are learning. P people have their PhDs in just one cell. You can do your doctorate on just one cellular function because a cell is not just a little jello ball that's walking around. There is mitochondria. There are amazing changes going on. And the cell membrane, you know, we look up at the sky and we look how complex it is. We are just starting to understand how that complexity is reflected. The smaller things get. Where we used to say, oh, well, the atom is the smallest thing. Now we know there's things that are smaller than that. So science, remember, God is the creator of science. So true science will always defend God's preborn and biblical principles. Good. Um, I feel like I'm on jeopardy. <laughs> I'll uh, take fetal development for a thousand. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's only for 200. So okay. give uh, me the 200. Yeah. Do do some types of hormonal birth mm -hmm. control prevent implantation? implantation, sorry, if an egg were to be fertilized. Sure. Let's talk about birth control because that's always, a, and that's a question we get from a lot of our patients. Patients that have maintained sexual purity, we talked about that with the kids yesterday, and we gave, gave a whole hour on that. So even when we have couples that come into our office and they want to know, hey, we're getting married in November or something like that, but we're still in school, he's doing this, I'm doing that, we like to hold off, but we really kind of like to have sex, you know, because that's on their list of priorities. So we give them different options. What's the easiest option? Well, you know, as far as using condoms and spermicide, so egg and sperm never get together, because we have to be consistent and believe that we are created in the image of God at that moment of conception. There's a challenge when it comes to birth control as far as what is actually going on. Because you will never see a trial that looks at ovulation or not. Every trial, and it can cost $100 million, $200 million to do a, a drug trial. Every trial's endpoint is not whether there was ovulation or not, it's was there a baby or not. Did you deliver a baby? Did you have a recognized pregnancy? When it comes to birth control pills, there are higher dose pills and there are really low dose pills and then there are low low dose pills well how do, how do you choose which pill somebody is going to be on well the higher the dose pill the more likely that somebody might have side effects like nausea or headaches or breast tenderness but the higher the dose pill is the more likely it's going to prevent ovulation the low dose pills and sometimes they're going down to less than 20 micrograms of, of uh, ethanolestradiol real low dose pills they will give less side effects maybe less nausea less chance of headaches and breast tenderness but you really don't know what the mechanism is as far as is it preventing ovulation or is it making the lining of the uterus just an environment where fertilization occurred in the tube and it worked down and it couldn't implant how do we counsel our patients first there is natural family planning and people have been using natural family planning, following their cycle, yeah, checking cervical mucus, but there's a really great way that is better. You know, condoms and spermicide prevent the union of egg and sperm. Ovulation predictor kits. I mean, they used to be expensive. They're in the dollar store now. What's an ovulation predictor kit? Use it just like a pregnancy test. People used to always take their temperature, and they go, my temperature, my temperature, my temperature. I'll say, hey, my temperature's up. And guess what that meant? It meant you ovulated two days ago. And then you, I mean, if you're trying to get pregnant, that doesn't really help you out that, you know what, we should have had sex two days ago. That doesn't really help out. Ovulation predictor kits are different. They say you are going to ovulate in 12 to 36 hours. So you can actually use an ovulation predictor kit to know when not to have a relationship. Now, what are the forms of birth control and contraception that are absolutely in abortifacient? IUDs. What is an IUD? It's a little, like they're, usually they're T-shaped. They go inside the lining of the uterus doesn't really affect the ovary, doesn't affect ovulation, doesn't affect conception, and moment of conception actually happens in the ampullary area of the tube. But then when you have this tiny little 
one day, two day, three day new pregnancy, it lands inside of the lining of the uterus and it's not a good environment. It's either super thin and, or it's just a sterile inflammatory response. It's kind of like if you took seedlings in your greenhouse and you have a little sprout that's, that sprouts and you say, I'm going to take this little sprout and I'm going to take it to Pensacola. It's 105 degrees. We're going to go up to that white hot sand on Pensacola Beach and we're going to plant that little seedling there in Pensacola Beach. Is that seedling going to survive? Nah, it's going to be dead the next day. That's an infl a, a hostile environment. So there are lots of different forms of contraception, and we try to guide our patients in the proper way that would prevent conception, union of egg and sperm, because as far as I'm concerned, I'm going to be consistent. When you have that union of egg and sperm, that is a new person created in the image of God. Good, kind of a follow-up with mm -hmm. that. Um, because God says life is in the blood, do you personally consider life to being at merging of egg and sperm or at implantation? Oh, union of egg and sperm. Because conception happens in the tube. It might be three or four days before the most sensitive blood pregnancy test will tell because you don't have a positive pregnancy test, even with the most sensitive blood pregnancy test, until that fertilized egg, that new person, has actually gone down into the lining of the uterus and starts to communicate with the mother. And so when did we become a new person? Not an implantation. We have new cells and new DNA, and that is unique at that moment of conception. And then it's going to go to 2, 4, 8, 16, all the way to a morula phase. And then that's when you're going to have that implantation. There are dozens of cells already. So if we're going to be consistent, and we need to be consistent, conception is that moment we're creating the image of God, and then that baby kind of works its way down, takes a three- or four-day journey, and then we find out about it. So when some people say, well, we... We've had groups that have said, well, we are better than them. They just, you know, are, you know, supporting life at the, at the moment of, you know, you have a, a heartbeat bill. And people vote for the heartbeat bill. And, and people will say, well, we are support life and we're not going to support that because we believe life begins at conception. The challenge is I can't do a blood test. I can't prove you when conception happened. Once I have a positive pregnancy test, I can go back and say, hey, it's August the 10th. And because we just had a positive pregnancy test, conception happened four days ago. But I can't tell you four days ago that it just happened right now. So that's one of the challenges. But we have to be consistent. We're creating the image of God, conception, not implantation. Okay, just a few more. This was another sure. popular question, because heavy one too. But how do abortions work? Okay. Um, there's a lot of details. In fact, if you go to our website, prolifedoc.org, or you go to our YouTube channel, which is D-R-L-I-L-E, the practice that I took over had an abortion machine and all the abortion equipment. Without blood, without baby parts, we actually demonstrate how a first, second, and third trimester abortion is actually performed with the actual abortion machine and with the actual instruments. So rather than in, you know, with the kids, we've done that. We've put it up on the Internet. You can go home. You can watch it on your phone. But it's brutal. I mean, first trimester is done with a suction machine, and we actually went through that with the kids yesterday as far as actually done. In fact, where's my computer bag? All right, I can go grab. Let me grab. You got 10 extra seconds. Let me run over here, and I'm going to just show you one quick example. And I carry these around because you have to understand the brutality of what abortion actually is. When we do, in the, the video, the DVD, we have some DVDs that are out there, but we actually show the life of the baby on the inside and how we treat them as in the preborn as patients, but then we go through the brutality of abortion. Nobody wants to see it, but you have to reveal it because that is the truth. This is an actual suction curette. This suction curette has a tube that goes down to the abortion machine. The abortion machine, if you look at the motor, has a half horsepower motor in it, just like in your garbage disposal back at your house. You have the baby on the inside, and it can be, be a baby as developed as Sydney. Sydney was at 12 weeks gestation. You saw her jumping and sliding. You have the cervix, and you have the uterus up there. How's the first trimester abortion done? The cervix is opened and dilated, and then this tube, the suction curette, and you can see it has an opening at the end. That's pushed up right where Sydney was jumping and sliding. And then the suction machine is turned on. How strong is that suction machine? If I put this tube inside of a steel paint thinner or paint, you know, turpentine can, you know, a steel can that you can stand up on, and I turned on the machine. This is what we demonstrate on the videos. You will see that steel can just go crunch, just like a soda can in your hand. 
that's the kind of force that's being exerted on the baby. That's where they could say that uh, it's not a baby on the inside. It's just a blob of tissue. It looks like a blob of tissue after an abortion is actually done. But you can understand how that violent act is performed. But you, that's why we put them on video. We've got them on the DVD, and you can just go to our website. You can go to YouTube, and you can actually see me demonstrating first, second, and third trimester abortions. All right, two, two questions left. Yep. Uh, someone asks, how do you address a hospital committee that is requiring you to, in quote, provide emergency contraception as a requirement for, you, for your position as an emergency provider? What resources is available? Sure. Um, whether it is when it comes to right of conscience. You know, Alliance Defending Freedom is a group of lawyers that we work with all the time out in Scottsdale, Arizona, known as ADF. It was started by Alan Sears. Our chairman of our board, Doug Napier, was a constitutional attorney who worked with ADF all the time. ADF will defend whether you're a doctor or whether you're a nurse, your right to conscience when it comes to the abortionist, so, so you contact them. Um, now, they will defend you. But if you took a job, say, at Planned Parenthood, they're not going to be successful because that is your primarily, that is your role, that is your job description is to engage in abortions. But if it is emergency contraception or whether it is an abortion that they say, hey, I know you don't like to do this, you've got to go scrub this case over in room 11. And you say, no, that's against my conscience. ADF will defend you and they will advise you and guide you and they will protect and defend you. Okay, uh, last question. Uh, I was asked, can you share your testimony? We can end with that. Love to. Um, blessed to uh, be raised by Christian parents. You know, came to have a solid relationship with, uh, you know, Jesus at a really young age. And so that was really when I started to realize that, and our parents taught us, that whatever you do in life, you've got to find a way to use your training, use your career for kingdom service. And so that was really a goal. So our kids have always been involved in mission trips. You probably offer mission trips with you. But I recognized from a young age, and I was blessed to have great parents, went to a great church, that, yeah, even as a little kid, I realized I have fallen short of the glory of God. I am a little sinner, and uh, I have a sin nature. And that if I don't recognize the salvation and the gift of salvation that is available through Jesus and understand the gospel is the good news. And that's why Jesus came. It's not just a matter of all the little Bible stories. Jesus came for all of us, lived a perfect life, gave his life for all of us, was dead for three days, and rose again. And that is the basics of the gospel. I mean, Adam and Eve fell. You know, they fell in Genesis 1. and No, in Genesis 3 when they had the fall. And so God said, man, I really wanted this to be a perfect world. But they fell. But then God loved us enough to said, they blew it. But I'm going to make a way that they can still experience eternal life and, and you know, live in union with me. So, you know, I met a beautiful lady, and we are involved in kingdom service throughout the country. And this is our goal, is just to be able to share the good news of the gospel, the message of forgiveness. We'll have a lot of people in meetings like this will say, I'd love to get involved in the pregnancy center, but no, nah, I can't. It's like, why? Well, back in high school or college, I had an abortion, so, man, I'd, I'd love to get involved. It's like, you are uniquely qualified to be a counselor at a pregnancy center. You know better than anybody else the fears and the anxiety and the loneliness of having an unplanned pregnancy. I mean, was Paul a perfect guy throughout all of his life? No, Paul was running around killing Christians. Did Jesus still use him? Yeah. Did Paul hold the garments of everybody when they were getting ready to stone Stephen? He sure did. Paul said, Forget about what lies behind and press on towards what's ahead. What did Paul say to the church of Ephesus? He said, pray for me that I would have the courage to speak as I must. This is Paul who would show up at a new city, go to the synagogue, get the snot beat out of him, get up, brush himself off, and go off to the next city. And this is Paul who's saying, pray for me that I have the courage to speak as I must. You have a pastor here that has that kind of courage to have a strange guy that he's never met come and you know, be in his pulpit. We need to encourage our pastors. And if you are visiting from another church, and you're like, you know what? I've been at church such and such and been there 10 years and nobody's ever talked about abortion. You have to think, okay, then I'm going to go to that pastor. And I'm going to say, we're going to encourage you to speak as you must. And if he says, we're not going to touch that subject, you have to think, is this where I want to worship? Is this where I want to do my kingdom service? Is this where I want to raise my kids? So kingdom service is an important role for Les and I. It's an important role for our kids. We were blessed to be you know, raised by godly Christian parents, and our goal is to do kingdom service here on earth. All right. Y'all had great attention. I hope I didn't keep y'all too long.
but we've been blessed. Thank you for all the hospitality. If you have other questions, kids, if you have questions, I'll meet you over there at the back. We've got some of the DVDs. But uh, you can go on the TikTok even. We had one TikTok in about three weeks and had over 100,000 views. TikTok, I, I didn't even know what TikTok was, but we have lots of resources, whether it's TikTok, Instagram, go into our website or even YouTube. You can spend the weekend. You have a three-day weekend, come, you can binge watch Bill Lyle. You know, and just, my wife doesn't do it, you know, she hears it. <laughs> But you can just go to Dr. Lyle on YouTube, and you can just we put up something new at least twice a week. All right, God bless y'all. Thank you for the invitation, and thank you for your time. Thank you very much for being <clears throat> here with us, and uh, they have some stuff back there. If you'd like to stop by, see that, look online. ProLifeDoc.org is that. So I think there's maybe one or two questions I didn't quite get to. So feel free to see them. They're going to be heading out. They got to be at the airport at 4.40 a.m. I think as their shuttle picks him up. So uh, they're heading back. He's got patience to see in the morning. So uh, we'll stand, be dismissed. Pastor, anything I need to say or do? Or he's got a grandkid in arms. So priorities, priorities. So all right, well, uh, that's all I have. So you are dismissed. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>